I am uh, Lady Gladyscotchon from Trimeris. My name is Welsh and hard to spell, so I wrote it here in case anybody is curious. Um, it's just like Gladys, though, so don't worry about spelling it uh, or pronouncing it correctly. Um, so today I'm going to cover a series of beauty and hygiene recipes from the Chortula manuscript uh, collection. As Jada mentioned, uh, she is a we believe that she was a physician in Salerno. I'm certain of it. Every time Chorchula is presented to us, she is drawn as a woman, and she actually becomes sort of a symbol of health itself for uh, a few centuries in the middle of our period. Um, so I have here um, the hardcover Latin side-by-side -side version and the softcover version, which has an amazing index of uh, ingredients. So they're kind of both worth having. Um, and Monica Green is absolutely worth supporting twice. So. Um, I encourage you, if you want to delve into this manuscript, to get both. Um, there's also a really amazing um, foreword that talks about whether or not uh, Trotula was a woman, or Troda, which is actually the, the name of the person who wrote the Trotula. Um, but there's actually three different manuscripts in here. Um, they're always presented as a collection of women's health uh, manuscripts, or a manual of women's health. And it was used up through the 15th and 16th century. So. This is basically like right before the Victorian era and what they figured out at that point, they were using this. Uh, so I'm just gonna take you sort of speedily through a series of um, uh, what I like to call like a sort of 12th century get ready with me based on this Italian uh, medical manual. Um, so I'm gonna demonstrate a few things. I'm also just gonna tell you about a few things, but I'm gonna dive right in um, so that you can see everything going on. But um, as I'm working, if anyone has a question, I'm fine with answering questions. Um, you can type them in the chat and Jada can read them to me, or you can raise your hand and she can um, have you unmute and, and ask your question. So um, to start with, the, the first thing they talk about is washing your face with warm water um, and using French soap. So this is Marseille soap. Um, this is the soap that was made from the recipe for Aleppo soap that the Crusaders brought back. Um, from the Holy Land. And uh, if this is still made like with the same thing, Marseille soap is um, governed by the French government. So I'm just gonna wash my face. I have a little basin of water over here. And my nice fresh soap. It's made with olive oil. It's a really like clean, sort of almost like, it almost smells medicinal just because it's so plain. Um, but I actually like it. You can get it scented. Ooh, if you prefer. All right, so French soap. Um, you can get it scented if you prefer. I have a lavender one right here, but I have super sensitive skin, so this is, I just share it. Um, the next thing they talk about, uh, so after that, there's, they talk about different things you can do to condition your skin. Um, applying a body mask of henna and egg whites. So henna, you can get colorless henna, um, and then you just mix the powder or the powdered uh, leaves with egg whites, and then they describe putting that all over your body. So that's like a protein mask um, for your skin. It's gonna be really good, and henna is skin conditioning as well. That's why it's used as a cosmetic. Um, then to smooth skin and soothe burns, um, because as part of your preparation of your skin, um, it's very important. It's mentioned a lot of times, and there are a lot of very honestly scary recipes about removing your hair. And in the Chortula, they say remove all your hair essentially from the eyebrows down. So you should have hair on your head, you should have eyebrows, and that's about it for ladies. And this is sort of in keeping with most cultures where public bathing is done. Um, because if you're going to go out and bathe in public, usually everybody is removing all, most of their pubic hair um, because you're, it's, I don't, when we see each other, we want to have less hair. I, I don't know. But it's, it's sort of a recurring thing in cultures that have public bathing. And the public bathing was brought back, a uh, practice brought back after the crusade. They actually thought the crusaders were disgusting because they didn't bathe enough. That's a whole side note. Um, so, and then... Um, to soothe your skin after the depilatory in case it hurts, they recommend that you wash your skin in water 
that oats have been soaked in or bran. So that's a really nice um, moisturizing thing that you can do. And you can soak in it like a bath, like we have oat baths, or you can just rinse with it. Okay, so the thing that's interesting to me about this is it honestly isn't super different from a modern routine. There are lots of things in it that are very similar as far as function and what they do when you're using them on your skin. Um, all right. So um, the next thing in the routine, and it's, it's interesting because it has a sort of head down, it's listed in order, um, but that's most medical manuals are listed starting with the head and going down in time period. So that's probably what that is about. So this deodorant is made from uh, boiling bilberry leaves. You can see the green. Um, boiling bilberry leaves in white wine. Strong white wine, old white wine. Those are two things that are usually referred to as the same. And then they say, apply it to a cloth. And then the lady can apply it anywhere she smells. And it actually does work because the strong acidity, ooh, you can smell the wine. The strong acidity of the wine actually kills all of the sweaty bacteria. So it sort of is a preemptive antibacterial for your armpits. Um, and I have tested it for quite a while before, even in some sweaty situations. It does work surprisingly well. Question. Okay. Yes. Um, I see that it is a, it's a color. It's a, like a little reddish. Yes. Does that come off on your chemise at all? Your shift, your kamichia? Um, so this, so I actually usually do it in a, before I put my top on and I let it dry before I put any kind of clothing on. Um, so that is how I keep it from staining my shift. Um, in the book, it says you can also use the bilberries, but every time you do that, it is bright red, and then it's really staining. When you just use the leaves, it's not, it's not as bad, and if you let it dry, I've never noticed a color coming off. Okay, thank you. No, that's a good question. Um, so the next thing we have is um, a hair powder perfume. So this is something that's especially sort of novel um, to us because we're not used to thinking about powdered perfumes, but powdered perfumes are actually very common um, in, in period and throughout most of history because perfumes were made to this very elaborate, painstaking, time-consuming, labor-intensive, expensive process of infusing fragrant things into oils. And you have all these powdered, very expensive fragrant ingredients, and after they come out of the oil, they might still have a smell of that perfume on them, the amalgamated perfume of all the smells. So you don't want to just throw that stuff away. And they would keep those things and they would use them as a powdered perfume. Um, this is an example of ma actually making a powdered perfume just in and of itself so you can use it in your hair. It works a little bit like dry shampoo. Um, and it's just a powder. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see, but it's just a, a really fine powder. Um, and there's no shame in using a coffee grinder for this because we don't have servants to figure everything out for us. So what I like to do to put it in my hair and it says, it actually, this is almost exactly what's described. It says, she puts her hand in her hair to make little furrows, and then in those little furrows, she sprinkles the powder. So the first few times I did this, I was absolutely certain I was going to end up, like, with some sort of, like, I don't know, spice cabinet dandruff going on. But it actually, if you work it in really good, like this, it actually... Um, doesn't end up falling out because you have it very finely powdered so it's not like flakes um, falling out of your hair. This is made with um, a simple five ingredients, cloves, um, nutmeg, these are whole nutmegs if you've, if you've never seen them, uh, nutmeg, rose petals, balangal which is um, a sort of a softer, lighter uh, ginger. It's very, it has a nice spicy scent when you grind it. And then uh, watercress. Now the watercress smells absolutely disgusting, um, but Rowan's believed it helped with hair growth, and that persists, that idea of using it for hair growth per persists from Dioscorides um, through the end of our period. So that's why that's in there. Um, also there's some different things about balancing the humors between these um, for a, a moist, cold 
tempered woman to use. Um, so that's the perfume. And if you are at an event and you maybe aren't showering every day, um, that is a really great solution. It makes your hair smell really nice. And it also kind of soaks up some of the oils in your hair. That's, well, I think a lot of what the rose petals accomplish is just soaking up oil. So there's also described in this one that you can combine that with rose water, grind it together and make a scented water. So I have that here. And then when you comb your hair, you can comb the smell into your hair. And it actually smells really amazing. This is actually, I actually prefer the smell of this almost to the powder just because it smells really delicious. Now, combs in and of themselves, they're not specifically like pointed out in the tortula, but combs were the primary way that women and, and men, everyone, were um, styling their hair and cleaning their hair to a certain extent. They would comb frequently um, and they would comb quite a lot with um, as narrow tooth comb as they could get away with. And that would help scrape some of the accumulated oils and things out of their hair as they were they were combing it. Um, so one thing that you can do to really like add your authenticity to your persona or really like think more like your persona is to get a comb and switch to combing your hair out at events. Um, I have, this one is horn. Horn is sort of like the medieval plastic. It's anti-static. So that's really nice. You can also get wood, um, bone, all kinds of other things. So get a comb um, and then you can use it to, uh, and then if you're late for an event, you can get ready and it's a demo. Um, <laughs> if you're, if you're someone who sleeps in, that's for you. Um, all right. So, uh, then we talk about an oil cleanse and it's, um, if they, they talk about making oil of tartar by taking a bunch of things, burning them, and then infusing them back in the oil. Um, I'm not really quite sure what's going on with that recipe yet. And I'm a little shy from trying it on my skin. Um, but it, it, it does seem very much like an oil cleanse, which is something that, um, dermatologists now are recommending. So a really good Substitute for the oil cleanse is cold cream, which I made in my class earlier. And I'll, even though this is not from the Trotula, it is a Roman cosmetic, it was used absolutely in Italy. And um, it's a basic serotum, which means ointment. Um, so I will um, include the recipe for that uh, in the list of all of these. Uh, then we move on to something that is another very interesting thing that goes back quite a while, and that is making starch out of grains. So for this, and this is part of why I find it really fascinating is because you find it in the Middle Ages, um, and then you actually find it going all the way back to descriptions in Roman um, household manuals about how women should be doing the same thing. And the Roman instructions are actually the best. They sort of lose more of their specificity over time, probably because people were so familiar with how to do it. This is also probably how they made household starch um, if they were starching garments and things like that. So what you do is you take your grains. I have just a little like storage pot of oats here. And you put them into a vessel. Um, I like to use like a pottery vessel. You need one that's sealed on the inside, but that the lid doesn't fit super tight because you do want air to flow in and out. Um, you submerge them in water and then you let them sit um, for anywhere between nine to 15 days. Um, there are sometimes instructions to change the water, sometimes not. Uh, that depends on the specific recipe. It doesn't seem to matter too much. Uh, I do it in my fridge because I live in Florida, which is home to all kinds of really nasty microbial things. Um, but in a northern climate where you have better yeasts and stuff like that, you could probably do it on your kitchen counter, which would be obviously the more traditional way that it would be done, not in your fridge. What happens is that the, um, the glutens sort of sink out and the starches get dissolved in the water. So after that, after the time of putrefaction, which is how they describe it in the trotula, you strain out the, um, all of the, the particles, all of the gluten and things like that. You strain that out. You just have this water that's kind of yellowy and cloudy. Then you put that onto a tray and you let it dry in the sun and the water evaporates and just leaves this beautiful white starch. And then you scrape it up and then you have starch to use in your cosmetics to put on your face or for your fabrics or things like that. Um, and this particular description um, is, is just a really fascinating little thing like the cold cream um, that gets passed on and on and on and rewritten. So we know people are actively using it as a method to make this starch. Um, I have done it though. It's worth it for the experience. It's not practical for making all your starch. It's very slow. 
painstaking way. And if you do that, you want to make way more starch water than you think you're going to need because the yield is very low. Um, it is worth doing if you want to delve. Um, so after that, um, we they talk about making a white ointment, and I'm gonna um, I'm not using that recipe today just because I feel like I have another one that is a little bit more um, appropriate for like almost all skin types and almost everyone. So uh, this, the one I'm going to use for a for sort of foundation, a face whitener is uh, number 236. And in 236, they have a, a series of processing techniques for rendering the white lead particulate into white lead powder. Now when we're doing modern cosmetics, everything we get comes already powdered. Um, and I will include my lead replacement recipe that I developed based on a few short studies I did with lead um, to match the texture as much as the color and opacity, um, which are, the texture is just as important as the other things when you're putting on your face. So they um, go through a whole bunch of steps essentially to refine the lead into a thin paste and then to dry it um, with rose water and then to sculpt it into tiny little balls and let them dry. To save my wrists a little bit, I do um, just mold them with a little heart-shaped mold, um, but it is essentially exactly the same thing. And you, I like to take just a little bit of rose water This rose water is really nice for everything. Why not? Kind of crush it up in your hand. Now, this is going to seem crazy, but I'm just going to smear it all over my face. And I'm not going to worry how it looks. And that, that's part of it. Part of the whole thing, I promise. Okay, right, that looks horrible. I know, I know, that's not, we're not done. So this is why I think it works really well for all skin types. Because um, with my lead replacement, I use zinc. Zinc is really soothing. You can also use titanium dioxide, which is also associated with being soothing. I'm gonna take my last little corner of this to say, take a damp cloth and wash up your pasty whiteness. So I don't know how well you'll be able to see this on the camera, but what it does after you've wiped it off, most of it, it leaves just a little bit of the pigment clinging to your skin. And it's just sort of a light brightening effect to your skin. It kind of evens out your complexion. This is sort of like a medieval BB cream, right? Or a medieval CC cream. It's not a full coverage. It's a very light coverage, but it's just enough to make you a little bit paler and more refined. And it's very important. It shows you stay out of the sun. You're not toiling and doing any hard labor. You're not sizing like a peasant. Um, it also says that your family has the money to pay for all these beautiful cosmetics to spend on just making you look good, making you smell good. Perfumes are where it started and then it went into making you look good too. Um, yep. All right, so we all know one last step to a beautiful face. We have our lilies, our field of lilies are white. Then we have to add our roses to the mix. So um, for this one, I'm using 278. Um, and this is done with Brazil wood, rose water. This is Brazil wood. Um, this is actually sapid wood. It's called Brazil wood because when people got to Brazil, they found the Brazil wood tree and they thought, wow, this reminds us of Brazil wood. We'll call this place Brazil. But what they call Brazil wood at that time is what we now call sapin wood. So this is sapin wood. You take a question? Yes. 
before you move to the next step, two questions in the chat box. Um, do the zinc and titanium oxide have a sunscreen benefit when you use them in this way? Um, in theory, yes, but because of some chemical issues, um, I would not rely on it to be your main sunscreen. So what I would do is put on a waterproof sports sunscreen, and then I would do the foundation treatment on top of it. Um, zinc and titanium dioxide, and I'm just gonna really simply say, zinc and titanium dioxide have a tendency to cluster up on a molecular level. And so without a lot of very complex chemicals with them, you can't assure that they're providing even sun coverage and not just tiny molecule clusters of coverage, which is not the same as full coverage. Um, I hope that helps. <laughs> Second question is, have you tried tin oxide? The trotula says it helps with sunburn. So tin oxide is another um, white pigment that you can use. I haven't um, done any work with tin oxide myself, but tin oxide does work and some people prefer the color. Um, so it's also a good uh, lead oxide replacement. Okay, that's all the questions so far, you can go ahead. Okay, especially if you're, I was gonna say, especially if your persona is from somewhere near a bunch of tin mines, um, tin oxide is gonna be your go-to rather than anything else. So that can be a persona choice for you as well. Availability trumps everything, and then after that, trends. <laughs> so um, the next thing is the, the rose, the, li uh, the roses among the field of lilies, which is continually used in poetry um, during the Middle Ages to describe what beautiful women, beautiful people look like. So um, you take shavings of Brazil, uh, or, or sappingwood rather, Brazil wood, medievally, um, and then you take uh, some alum crystals, and you take just tiny little bits of them, uh, and then you add rose water, and that soaks the red out. I don't really have a way to show you. It soaks the red out, uh, and because it has the alum in there, it keeps it from being too yellow, because sappingwood without a little, um, if it's too acidic, it, it turns orangey. But as you can see, this is bright, bright red. So this goes on your cheeks and it goes here. Low, because instead of, so we're emphasizing cheekbones nowadays here. They're emphasizing fullness. So we want the emphasis here on our cheeks to make us look well nourished. Um, Semi-related, the, the main thing that people would get treated for when they went to the hospital medievally uh, is actually malnutrition. So showing that you're well fed is a pretty big deal uh, and a, a pretty good way of showing your affluence. And then that was what most of these things are about. So you can build it as dark as you want. Um, and then this part might be better done with your finger. And what are you applying it with? This is a sea sponge. You can also use just a piece of cloth or your finger, whatever you feel like works. So this is another recipe. There we go. That you really can't make a lot of because the rose water will turn even with all the alum in it. Um, but again, if you are um, if you buy a rose water that has a little bit of preservative in it, then that will help keep it a little bit more stable. Um, on the shelf. Now this you could probably freeze. You could probably make, if you wanted to make up a bunch of this and freeze it in tiny little ice cubes and just get out one little ice cube for every event, that would totally work. So uh, other than hairstyling, this is my full skincare regimen, get ready with me, from the Chochula. Um, I have, I can read recipes if there's any specific ones that you're interested in. I also uh, can answer any questions or go back over any of the things I talked about. Okay, so I don't see any other questions over in the chat box. Okay. 
So if you want to read a couple recipes that you really like, um, you can. Um, oh, there is a, a post in the chat box about white, lead white and tin oxide, if anyone wants to read it, but I'll go ahead and turn it back over to GLaDOS. And if you have any questions, either raise your hand or type in the chat box. We have more than 30 minutes till the next class. Oh, uh, one question. Is there any tooth or dental care in the trotula? There are, but they're, they're sort of scary. Um, so when you're going through medieval recipes, you'll quickly get a feel for the fact that there are some things that you look at them and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Those things are moisturizing. I know that. The other things to look at and you're like, I don't even really understand what's going on here. Um, and a lot of the, or they're like, wow, that's unnecessarily harsh. So there are tooth scrubs that are presented, um, but they talk about like pulverized marble. They talk about pumice and using that to scrub your teeth. Um, and those things are just straight up too abrasive. They'll, they'll wear your enamel away. Um, cavities weren't as much of an issue medievally as they are now because sugar just wasn't as available um, until the Elizabethan era or that's not Italy, but until later when we started getting sugar um, from the new world, there just wasn't as much sugar. Um, but there, there's a lot of uh, tooth preparations. The tooth powders are like with uh, ashes or things like that. I do have a tooth powder that I made that is sort of based off of one of the trotula recipes, but it's not fully. Um, they say you should burn the ingredients and then use the ashes on your teeth, um, which might be like using charcoal, but most, dentists say that charcoal is too abrasive for teeth. So um, I try to balance with um, a modern modern scientific study as well. But this is uh, just a sea salt and then cloves and cinnamon. Um, and there is a, a lengthier recipe that involves, uh, as I said, crushed marble and pumice, but you can use this and it's actually quite, quite nice. Um, so you just need like to wet your finger and then put a little on there and then you can scrub your teeth with it. There's like spices and it is abrasive. It does help to sort of rub the tartar plaque off your teeth. It's not, it doesn't taste too bad. There is a similar one with sage, I think in the Glee Ornamente Della Donna. I looked at the tooth ones while I was going through this and I was like, hmm. One question just popped up on, is there a way to handle oily hair that you have found? Um, they actually wouldn't have seen oily hair as a problem um, in period. Uh, most hair styling starts with hair perfuming and perfumes were almost entirely oil based. So you're actually adding oil to your hair. So the solution to oily hair is add more oil. Um, a lot of, and think about, I know this sounds really strange, but think about a lot of the actual hairstyles that are being done. They're based on braids, up sweeps, tied up hair, they're very sleek. Um, and for braids, um, like I do 12th century Norman braids, and for that oily hair is perfect. So my fresh from the shower, freshly washed hair is actually less desirable. Um, we go for that plain flyaway hair look, but it's very much not in keeping. And if you look at the artwork, you can see that they don't do, when they do do like the mermaid hair thing, um, if you look at it, it looks very uniform, right? That's because those are ladies who have taken out braids and are left with those waves that are all exactly uniform. Um, so add, add more oil, pick a smell you like and add that, that smelling oil to your hair. I will add that, um, if you are worried about oil in your hair, like at an event, say you're going to a war, say you'll be there for a long weekend or a full week and you're worried about accumulation of oil, the, the, um, the number one, tweet, whatever that you did earlier, that hair water and the hair powder, when you use that together, there have been a couple of people who've written blog posts about using it at Penzik. That yeah. works as a cleansing conditioner. It keeps down the oil and it keeps your hair smelling good. 
Yeah, and also combing. Like, um, it, it's easy to overlook, but combing just in general, it actually presses down against the shaft of your hair without breaking it and scrapes oil, accumulated oils off of it. Um, and uh, I can't remember her name, but the lady who does the um, Tudor Monastery Farm talks about it in uh, Tales from the Green Valley, which is another series that she did about how just using the comb physically can help clean your hair. Um, so get yourself a nice comb, make yourself some hair powder, and then once you get there, it's because it doesn't keep, um, once you get there, make yourself your scented rose water. And I, that's what I use um, at Wars if I'm not planning to shower all the time, or if I'm planning to run experiments, which include not showering all the time. Um, I'm going to read the Brazilwood uh, Rouge just because I enjoy it. I really enjoy this particular recipe. Um, so they, they've just given you an ointment for whitening your face. Uh, from this, let the woman anoint her face, and afterward, let her redden it thus. Take shavings of Brazil wood and let it be placed in an eggshell containing a little rose water, and let there be placed in the same place a little alum. And with this, let her anoint some cotton and press it on her face, and it should make her red. It works. It's a very pale, translucent, sort of buildable red, but it's absolutely there, especially if you're putting on over um, a white primer or skin treatment of some type. Um, and actually, that's a thing worth talking about. Uh, Meister Giada and I uh, had some interesting discussions about um, different skin tones and what is actually going on with what's going with, with these things. So. I don't think it's so much a preference for whiteness as much as a preference for an idealized skin tone. Um, so I think maybe if you're less like completely pale, corpsely white as me, um, you might want to try um, a foundation that is maybe just a couple shades lighter than your natural or is more saturated than your natural if you have a very neutral skin tone. Uh, they very much like the vivid colors, but something that sort of evens out your skin um, is definitely what the look of what they're going for with putting the white pigment on their faces. But they're not actually, when they describe it, they're not actually saying, they say to be white, but in the actual you know, descriptions of the recipes, they're saying it will make your skin brighter, it will make your skin glow, it will make your skin luminous. So I don't think it's actually about being pale, pale white until you're getting into later period um, and after period makeups. When I have tried to do what Glado showed you today on my skin, even as deep as my skin tone is, it does the same thing. It doesn't give me like a white mask. Like when you think of the Elizabethan um, portraits where their faces are like stark, stark white. What yeah. it does is just gives me like this, this glow, this angelic type sheen. And I, you know, work it to where I'm, I've wiped away most of it. And I'm left yep. with a good base to put the rouge on, but it doesn't make me look strange. I don't look like I have on white face. Yeah, and if you're uncomfortable with the whiteness of it, I think you could add a little bit of iron oxides um, in yellows, reds, browns as suit your skin tone and make a very pale version of it that has that same effect of brightening, but it's like your own skin tone, but glowing. Um, and this is sort of their way of doing it without having like dewy primers and eight layers of powder and set glass seven, seven skin, glass skin techniques and stuff like that. Their solution was uh, basically like a, a brightener. Okay, uh, let's see. So your, let's see. I just wanna make sure I know what the schedule is. Your class was slated for about 45 minutes. We have about 10 minutes left. So if you would like to talk about whatever you want to, I'm sure we'd be enamored with it because I love the fact that you know all this stuff and you can share anything you want with us. And if you have questions, please post them in the chat box. Absolutely. Um, I'm actually um, going to be working on a version of the um, body mask that uses powdered 
uh, egg whites so that you could maybe take it like to an event, pour some out, and then like sort of activate it by adding water to it. Um, I, and that's the thing I try to, I try to find ways to make the things um, that also work with what we're doing um, in the SCA and how we, how we live in the SCA. <clears throat> um, Question. Another, oh yeah. Recommended sources for the supplies. And is there a handout which she will, she will pr provide something and I'll post it in the Cadoro Salon group. Uh, I haven't finished it yet. Um, but I am going to give you a type up of each of the recipes that I, I talked about here today. I have the numbered list here and I just have to finish typing them all up and then I will send it along. Um, so there will be a handout, um, a digital handout. As far as supplies, um, I, my first place that I go every time is a website called TKV Trading. Uh, they are out of San Francisco. So at the moment they have partially shuttered their business and they're social distancing at work. Um, so they're a little bit slow and they're understocked on a lot of things at the moment. So if you go there, it doesn't look the greatest, but I promise you it's a really great um, website uh, and all of the things that they have there, they test them, they know how to use them. They are people who make cosmetics themselves. So they offer lots of great help um, and information about things. Um, and that is really awesome. Um, they're very supportive. Uh, I went and I ordered like a multi-pack of different colors and they let me trade out the pigments that um, weren't period for period pigments. So I could have like an all period pigments uh, sampler pack uh, and they were totally fine with that. Um, they're always really like interested when I tell them little snippets about what I'm doing. They're like, whoa, that's so cool. That's so weird and so cool. Um, it's also um, a mostly women run business and it's women owned. So I really like that, of course. Um, so I would recommend going to TKB Trading. And I'm going to say every time I go there, every time I buy one thing, I buy $20 worth of things because I just have to get a sample of that pretty new pigment so I can smear it on my face like every time <laughs> they have lots of beautiful, beautiful pigments. Um, but they're, so they also will help educate you about what you're looking for. So that if you do choose to look somewhere else, you'll know what you're looking for because you've gotten high quality ingredients, you know, the, the way they're described, the way they're marketed. Um, and you'll also know the way they feel and the way they act when you use them in case you get something less than quality in the future. One more question about recipes for beginners. Um, the question is basically what would be the best recipe for someone just starting out? Actually, a lot of these recipes are very simple. Like they're just as simple as, you know, mix water with oats and let it sit and then strain the water off and use it to wash. So there, there are little things. Um, it's sort of like, I, I talked with a cooking Laurel about this. It's sort of like making a meal of sides and appetizers. You make just a series of small things that all kind of add up to quite a bit when you put them all together. But each thing, if you're just doing each thing individually, most of these are not super difficult. Uh, so the recipes that will be in the book will be, or in the handout will be things that you can start right away. And also, Tortula is a book of women's things, but um, there are specifically things in here about how to help Batman and how to help Venuses. So it's not just for ladies. And my working theory is that that is because women were in charge of making the medicinal cosmetics and applying them properly to their men in the age-old tradition of women being made responsible for how their men groom themselves and look when they leave the house. Um, so that's sort, of, that's sort of my working theory about um, part of why there's so much emphasis in this time period, because there is actual like um, documentation in paintings of men absolutely appearing to wear makeup as well. So, so you could totally make your husband up and it's totally legit and historical. <laughs> okay, the next question is what tips? Oh, TKB training is definitely open. Like you said, they're, um, they're probably just uh, socially distancing and maybe have some limited supply if they're importing anything. Um, yeah. What tips can you share that you gained through your experience? So what lessons have you learned? 
Um, especially when you're working with ingredients that you're not familiar with, um, start with a recipe you know, uh, or that you're familiar with the other things in it. Take your time getting to know individual ingredients and including using them just completely on their own. Uh, this is especially true for working with um, oils, butters, also fats and things like that, um, to know the consistency and how they work, their melting point, their, uh, their smoking point, things like that. But it also is true for individual herbs and stuff as well. The more you know the in individual ingredients and sort of the personality of their personal chemistry, the, the better it is and the easier time you have combining things and also looking through the book and seeing that looks like something I could do, that looks like it would burn my skin off. And that's an important thing. That's also a thing. A lot of people dive into this and they don't think about the fact that they're still putting possibly corrosive things on their skin um, because these recipes come from a time before we had a lot of um, understanding of, of how skin works and how chemicals work on the body and how pores work and all kinds of things. So you do wanna keep your modern science study of dermatology and skincare and uh, pigments and cosme uh, cosmetic formulation right alongside your historical study so that you make sure you're not hurting yourself or your friends while you're doing it. And be prepared for when people tell you, is that lead? Because people will just never stop about it. Would you um, recommend the environmental working group uh, site for people to look up or I guess, what are those sheets? Material safety data sheets. Yes, that those sheets. Yes, uh, material safety data sheets or shortened to MSDS. Um, Environmental Working Group, I think, is a good website. What I usually do is just go on Google and I type in MSDS zinc oxide or MSDS um, starch or whatever, and they'll usually tell you um, whether or not things are corrosive, um, whether they're safe for your eyes, whether they're safe to ingest, safe for your skin, things like that. Okay, well, I think we are about done. We're almost three quarters of an hour. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Um, and I will share a handout um, with the, the recipes that I talked about today. I hope everybody enjoyed. Have a great rest of the day.